Jones on this side of the scrum. One from the BC Bears, the other from the Prairie Wolfpack. That's a name for a footy side. And a big scrum from the Turbos. How about the pop on Marshall? And Bidens gives him an earful. All right, and welcome to this edition of the Canadian Ruck. This podcast, as you might have guessed from that little intro, we have front rower Hubert Bidens, uh, freshly retired, but he joined us for a small conversation. Uh, it's going to be a it's going to be a fun one to listen to with uh, with Hubert coming up shortly. All right, little plug here: I'm trying to get more listeners, get uh, more people spreading the good rugby word of Rugby Canada, and uh, you know anything I guess involved with rugby is always a great word to spread. So contact us uh, and put it out there if you see if you see a canadian rec post retweet it if you see it on instagram put it in your story if you see it on facebook or if you're joining the group make sure you like it and share it um even, even those you can contact us you know drop us a line on twitter at canadian rock instagram the underscore canadian underscore rock and facebook at the canadian rock but if you just want to drop me a line you know a guest uh, a guest idea or questions that you want to ask somebody it's the canadian rock at gmail.com with that, we're on a lot of a lot of platforms, as uh, our loyal veteran listeners know. We're on. We've got our videos on YouTube. We're on Spotify, the iTunes, Google Podcasts, and Castbox. Uh, so you're watching and listening. That's awesome. But make sure you're follow, subscribing, and sharing. Get those messages out. Get those uh, the words out from these fellas. Had a good chat with Matt Heaton today, and he said it's great when we can hear the pathways of some of our national women and national men and past and present to see how they got to where they went. And uh, I think that's a great opportunity for young and old to listen to how these stories transpire. If you're stumbling where to go, go right to the website, the Canadian Google it. I'm sure it'll pop up. That's the Canadian All right. From there, we're going to, we got a few shout outs today. We had to, <laughs> the gray area last pod was great. Uh, lots of banter. Uh, it was nice to see. Uh, lots giving their thoughts on what they believe were the top three positions. The question was, if you were going to start a new club, say in Super Rugby, or maybe it was a, in ma Major League Rugby, maybe you're going to start a team in Halifax, or maybe you're going to pick up a team out in, uh, in Vancouver, or what have you. Um, the question was, what are those three main positions that you're going to focus on to fill out your roster first with, and then kind of surround them with uh, with the supporting players? And uh, I gave mine. I didn't give an order, but I said the eight, the nine, and the ten. And I uh, had lots of, you know, a dozen or so got back, if not more. And uh, I apologize. I'm going to apologize right off. There's a few that uh, commented on my Instagram story, but I'm a little Instagram green. Didn't realize I had to archive that post. It disappeared. And I couldn't find those responses again. So I apologize. If there is a way to do that, please give me a shout. Let me know how to do that because I, I feel bad. I'd like to give those people some shout outs. But uh, I'm, uh, I'm an Instagram novice, so to speak. I just realized how to put some fancy things on the Instagram story. But uh, I don't know. It's, it's uh, another one of those social media apps. So my apologies to those who replied to my Instagram story. Keep doing it. I've learned from a mistake. So if you want to reply to the Instagram story, do it. But on Instagram, some that have responded via Instagram, uh, one of the first was Jeff Hassler, previous guest. And uh, if you can guess it, Jeff, uh, uh, well, wing, wing, wing. He went through three straight wings. Um, might be a little biased there. Um, either way, that, that were, those were his thoughts. And then Jamie Cudmore, friend of the pod, uh, he said, his main ones were three, nine, and 12. So your tight head, your scrum half, your fly half. Um, but he also set a good second row and a great inside center and also a very valuable 15. So he, he threw six numbers up. Um, but he also said that the nine and 10 also have to have a strong kicking game. You know, think of a uh, Richie Mwanga or think of a uh, Aaron Smith, like those guys and Faf de Clerk, those guys have great boots on them. Uh, and he and Hassler had some nice chirps. So if you follow uh, Canadian Rock on Instagram, look for those little chirps back and forth between Cudmore and Hassler. Uh, Ryan Dunnett on Instagram said tight head, lock. And he threw in the eight, the 10, and the 12. So he threw out five names, five numbers. And again, choosing three is difficult to try and start your team around. Um, so those five, uh, five are pretty good picks there by Ryan. And then we w moved over to Twitter. David Castle, uh, friend of the pod, he's lis he listens quite a lot. He said tight end. Tight end was a fairly common one. He also said the scrum half, and then he also said center 12 slash 13, um, one or the other. Take your pick. 
And then Rugby Jeff on Twitter. Twitter <laughs> sorry, on Twitter. <laughs> Rugby Jeff. He also said tight end. He said the fly half in number eight. So there's a couple number eights out there as well. Peter Fitzgerald. So Fitzy out of St. John here said two, nine, and ten. So a hooker is the first hooker from the from the audience. Scrum half, fly half. And he also said maybe a 15. And then he gave a shout out to a few New Brunswick guys. Uh, Simon Pacey's ringing a bell is one of the names that he said I had played against Simon a long, long time ago. Um, he was a he was a caliber player, and, and then the last one on Twitter was Ken Goodland. Uh, he said again, tight head. He said again, tight head again after that, and then he said kicker. Didn't care who it was as long as they could kick. So he was he was all about the tight head. Uh, so thanks very much for uh, playing along uh, last week, um, and that's where we're kind of going to do that again today. So we're we're skipping some rugby news. There are a few things um, in the air, I guess, rugby wise, but. Uh, when I record this part, they've all been a few days old, so you've probably been over it. Uh, I think next week we'll get into the Dylan Hartley, Eddie Jones. Uh, I guess what what shook what shook down there. As I read it, I realized there's a lot more to it than just the initial um, statements that were being made. So um, we'll, we'll maybe get into that the next pod. But our gray area this week is basically I'm looking I want more feedback I, I love hearing from from listeners but this one's going to be kind of on coaching and uh, this is one of the questions that I sometimes ask guests is it it's the character over skill aspect and where your thoughts are there um, Jack Hanratty uh, who's rugby women uh, sorry rugby Canada's women's U20 coach. Uh, he's also rugby Nova Scotia senior men's and women's coach, and he's a rugby Canada academy coach, academy coach for the Atlantic provinces. He's also a great speaker. He's a great presence, and he's also a future guest. Uh, I've had my pr pleasure uh, to watch him at a, at a conference and speak. I, you know, I've met with him a few times, one on one, and chat. And very social, very nice guy, very smart, very intelligent rugby fella. In essence, at the conference I speak, in essence, this is what he said. In order to take skill over character, that skill would have to be among the best in the world. That's not exactly what he said. I'm paraphrasing. But in essence, basically what he said is that being the best in the world offers leeway. And if you're not the best in the world, then you know, you've really got to be a good character player. Think of Michael Jordan in his Last Dance documentary. I know that's one of the questions I like to ask guests because it's a fun Fun way to think like, who's your Jordan? Who's your Pippin? Who is your Rodman? MJ was a fierce competitor on the court, all right? But he was also very tough and rough on some of his teammates. And having the skill set that he did allowed him to possibly do that, all right? Gave him the luxury to be a hard person on his teammates. His skill set offered him offered him that luxury. He was It was a very rare skill set. You wouldn't see, you know, one of the one of the six you know one of the bench players acting like that they wouldn't get away with it but because he was jordan he could but does that necessarily mean it's the right way to go i mean yeah sure they won six championships while he was there but wayne gretzky won four he didn't treat his teammates like that Sidney crosby's won three he doesn't treat his team like that Derek jeter uh, from major league baseball he didn't treat teammates like that joe montana same thing doesn't necessarily mean that you're allowed to be an asshole just because you're good now, he pushed the players. He wanted them to be as good as he did, and that I fully get. But I guess, where do you draw the line? You know, we spoke, I, we speak a little bit on, on and off with some of the players about, you know, where do you draw the line on the no asshole policy? And how much leeway do you actually, do the players actually have when it comes to their attitude and lack of quality in their character? Is there a leeway? Is there really, is there like a, a matrix that if their skills so high they can be a jerk if their skills lower they can't how much is a coach and team willing to put up from a player that is more about the individual than it is about the team All right and those are questions that you know you often struggle with is it on the coach to work more with that player or on the team to try try to bring him around or bring her around uh, like how much is it on the coach to try and help that player with his character, with those deficiencies, as it is, a, 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 you know, with the team trying to do the same thing. And from that, like, when do you cut a player loose? Uh, you know, you, you hate to say, like, that a player is a cancer, but that's a, that's a term that's often thrown out when players just, they don't buy into the culture, or they try and have their own culture, or they just, that no asshole policy is thrown out the window for them, and, and you just need to, sometimes you need to cut, you need to cut a player loose. But when does that happen?
These are questions that all coaches and teams face. The ones that I often struggle with, you know, at high school level and definitely when I was coaching provincially. Um, and I think I struggle with it a lot because in my coaching, I'm a teacher as well. So it's the same for me in the classroom. Um, I do try to do more than just coach rugby. I try to do more than just teach my classes and my lessons. When I'm coaching and when I'm in my classroom, I'm also trying to coach character. I'm also trying to coach discipline. I'm trying to coach camaraderie. I'm trying to coach social skills. I'm trying to coach friendship. I'm trying to coach history of the game. Um, we give out uh, awards at the end of our games, each each uh, high school game. We have the uh, Gavin Hastings Band of the Match. We have the Richie McCaw Rugby IQ Award. And we have the Gareth Reese uh, Hardest Worker Award. And um, it's just a way to pay a little bit of tribute to, to some past legends of the game. Try and teach awareness on and off the pitch. We try to definitely teach enjoyment, but I think aside from rugby skills themselves, we also try and just teach life. I try and teach life lessons with them and help these kids along the ways. It's nothing for a kid to send me a text and say, can we go get a coffee? I'm struggling with my relationship or, you know, I'm having issues with my parents. Can we chat? And it's like, yeah, for sure. And um, as I've mentioned in past pods, my wife's a mental health specialist. So, you know, I, I get lots of great advice from her when I'm dealing with uh, students and athletes and my kids in my class. And, and I often use her tidbits to, <laughs> to help me along. But a lot of it is just that being able to relate to the kids and, and uh, taking it beyond the game. And I think that's, I believe that is a very important trait to have as a coach, as a teacher, as a, as a role model. I've read a number of books in this area, but a few stand out a little bit more than the rest. One is the jersey, right here behind me over my left shoulder, right in the center there. Um, the jersey was written by Peter Bills. It's a great read. Um, basically, it's about the All Blacks and their dominance over the last 100 plus years. It's a bit of a history, historical read of the All Blacks. Um, but a lot of it, uh, you know, it talks about their coaches not just being coaches, but they're actually life coaches. And how more important and how more, um, I guess, integral that has been to their success recently over the last 20 years when they've kind of made their coaching philosophy switch and their team culture philosophy switch was that having those coaches that were more than just rugby X's and O's, but rugby and life combined has really helped their, their club, that All Blacks organization, grow tremendously. Another one is Legacy, 15 Lessons in Leadership by James Kerr. Again, a great read. Uh, this one's about the All Blacks and their leadership model. And this one really, you know, the no assholes policy comes in there. It talks about being uh, ancestors of the game. It talks about uh, cleaning the sheds. And uh, I get lots of great quotes out of there from my rugby teams. And even in my classes, using some of their, their mantras to, to help uh, with camaraderie and with, uh, I guess, relationship and relationship building with students and players. And the last one is just a, a small read. It's called Coach by Michael Lewis. Uh, as I said, it's short, but it's about coaching self-respect, it's coaching sacrifice, it's coaching courage, and it's coaching endurance in life. And it's, uh, that one really kind of opened my eyes up when I read that about 10 years ago. Um, you know, being when at that time in my age, in my life, I was young 30s, and it was like all wins and losses. And uh, that one really opened my eyes that I'm looking at it differently, because a lot of these kids, they're not going to remember how many wins and losses they had. They're not going to some of these kids might, when they leave high school, they might never touch a rugby ball again. Um, some of them might go on and continue to play, but you also want them to be good people, not just a good rugby player. So a lot of it is focused around how to help them remember the times they had on the pitch or the times they had in my classroom or the times they had on the bus going to and from games and stuff like that. So all of these books have helped me on my coaching journey. I, I encourage you all to, to find them, give out, you know, go to chapters, go to Indigo, uh, you know, download them on your Kobo or whatever your e-reader is. I don't even know if they make Kobos anymore. Did I just date myself with that one? But I encourage you to find them and give them a read. So The Jersey by Peter Bills, Legacy, 15 Lessons in Leadership by James Kerr, and Coach by Michael Lewis, all great reads. Um, all very helpful for people that are in the coaching department, people that are in the leadership department. Um, people that understand or need to understand that there's more to life than wins and losses. Um, when the wins are nice for sure. And the losses can sometimes stay with you. But if you can teach kids that you learn from that loss and move on to the next aspect, I think it's a more important trait than just having a loss. So rugby brings a lot of the aforementioned topics and ideas together. 
am I overstepping my place, my boundaries as a coach? What are your thoughts? So this is the gray of the week. Gray area is should coaches stick to drills, plays, and skills? Or should rugby coaching encompass more than that and include life skills? I want to hear your thoughts. I want you to get back to me and talk about where you think the line is drawn for a rugby coach. Is there a line drawn? How far are you allowed to, to bend those laws to try and get through to a player? Um, and I, it just, I, I just want to hear back from what everybody thinks because I, I got some really valuable uh, advice from listeners over the past while about some different things. And I, I guess I'm always looking at ways to improve myself as a coach, but also ways to help others improve as a coach and to work with their students, work with their players in that capacity. So hit me up on uh, the Twitter, the Instagram, send me an email, drop me a note on Facebook. I don't care. Let's get your thoughts in. And coming up next, uh, Hubert Bidens. Hubert, uh, he's a fun little guest we had on there. He had 55 matches with Canada. He debuted back in 06 against the England Saxons. Uh, he's a member of Canada's Rugby World Cup squads in 2011 which was New Zealand, 2015 in England, and 2019, which of course was just in Japan. He had a couple seasons in New Zealand with Manawatu, and he played a couple seasons with New Orleans down in MLR, and he also played with Prairie Wolf Wolfpack in the Castaway Wanderers, and we'll be, uh, we'll be having a nice conversation with Hubert, so stay tuned. He is coming up next. All right, the Canadian Ruck would like to welcome Hubert Bidens to our podcast. Hubert, uh, thanks very much for joining us. It's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to get a chance to chat with you here tonight. Yeah, thanks for having me. Good to be here. All right. So let's let's jump right into this. So you were born in Saskatoon. You're living in Calgary now. Um, Saskatchewan's not your typical hotbed of rugby. How did you get involved in the sport? Like what, what drew you to rugby? Um, growing up, we always kind of had to have uh, a sport for every season. And I was not very good at soccer and not very good at, you know, softball or baseball or nothing. So I thought I'd give uh, lacrosse a try. And then I was talking to one of my buddies and he said, I'm going to play rugby. Why don't you come out? And so I started playing rugby because it was available. And then the rest is kind of history. So from there, you, you kind of went to the Wanderers. You went to Manawatu and then you ended up in, in New Orleans there. Talk to us about, I guess, your path, like university, you know, down the Southern Hemisphere, back over here in, the, in MLR to end up. How did, how did that all transpire for you? Well, for, for me, it, it all started with the, the Super League and playing for the Saskatchewan Prairie Fire. And then from there, got picked up to go play for Canada West and then for Canada. And then, you know, I didn't play very much university. I didn't play any university rugby. Uh, I played university football for the University of Saskatchewan. I played junior football for the Saskatoon Hilltops. And during that whole time, you know, kind of the football off season or the spring or the summer, I'd play club rugby or you know provincial rugby or rep rugby or whatever in Saskatchewan and then it just kind of took off from there so I didn't really get any huge opportunities I traveled on my own dime to Wales when I was 20 and uh, got my first kind of taste with the North Wales RGC 1404 when I think it was 2011 was the first year that I kind of semi pro type of a gig. Okay so from there you you, you kind of you kind of bounce back. You're playing a little bit overseas, but you're also playing with Rugby Canada. How was that for you, I guess, living in a different country and still trying to represent Canada? Yeah, it worked out pretty well for me. Most guys get a pro contract and they're there for, you know, eight or nine months, but all of my contracts were like three or four months. So I could bounce <laughs> back and forth kind of wherever, like man, with two, the season's pretty short. So it was, you know, 10 games in eight weeks, but you, you know, there for a little preseason. Then come back, play November tour type of a deal. Then maybe go back in February, play some club, come back for June. So I, I really enjoy bouncing around. And I mean, even with the MLR, the, the season's getting longer now, but you know, you're at most a six month commitment and it, it, it worked really well for me. I really enjoy that. Most of the guys hate it, but I, I really <laughs> liked it. It doesn't seem like a bad gig play rugby right for, you know, four or six months of the year. And then you can kind of, you know, dabble in something else, I guess. Um, talk to us about, New Orleans there. What was it like playing in that atmosphere? Uh, the city is absolutely great. It's like nowhere else. <laughs> like as far as even like the American South, it's just a complete anomaly compared to any other city. It's, you know, a little bit more liberal, a little bit more, you know, the 
French Canadian aspect of it and everything, Louisiana, the laws are, are different. Uh, are there laws? Well, I, I think there are. <laughs> I, went, I went to the prison for a prison rodeo there once and got a tour of everything and it was unreal. So there's definitely laws and some of them are kind of crazy. But. What is, what's a prison rodeo? Like a regular rodeo, but in the prison? Well, it's, it's not really a regular rodeo, but it's, it's, uh, the prisoners are the people with the rodeo. So this, this prison, it's Angola State Penitentiary, and it's, it's essentially a work farm. So there's different kind of cell blocks, but within it, they have the prisoners run a whole bunch of, I think it was 2,600 head of cattle that they sell for whatever. And they have, wow. you know, a garden and they have, they make their own hot sauce with chili peppers that they pick and it's all kind of crazy, but twice a year they have a rodeo and yeah, the rodeo, some of the events, you know, like bull riding they have, but you know, at the start of the rodeo, they just have eight or 10 shoots of dudes on bulls and they open all of them at once and it's kind of pandemonium or they'll do the, the rodeo poker thing or whatever. It's, it's a unique experience, but yeah. it's pretty interesting. <laughs> Sorry, a little sidetrack there. Yeah, that's kind of so. I guess I guess let's tie that back into rugby. The the experience in New Orleans is a one of those cities I've o I'd always loved to see. But the rugby aspect there, that's it seems like a new sport in that in that region. Yeah, so I think they've kind of had a, a club rugby scene in New Orleans or a club rugby team in New Orleans since the seventies. So it's been around. But yeah, most of the people that you talk to are like, "We have a rugby team." <laughs> it's like, uh, <laughs> "Yep, three or four of them." So. Um, so that was interesting. And then other than the weather, everything was great because the weather you're playing, we were playing in June. I think we played Seattle June, you know, end of June at 12 PM. And it was just absolutely miserable. Like oh. I was talking to Phil Mack, who was playing on the Seattle team. He's like, that was the worst game rugby I've ever <laughs> been a part of. It's just, yeah, you can't really do much, but. And he wasn't in the front row. He was just out running around. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's so, hard for everybody, I guess. Yeah, it is. That's true. So the MLR, in your opinion, what, what is it, what is it going to do to help Rugby Canada? Like, what are your thoughts there that can it help Rugby Canada, even Rugby USA? Well, I think it just gives more people an opportunity to, you know, make a living playing rugby so that you can go to work and it's going to the gym or it's, you know, training for rugby and you don't have to worry about paying the bills some other way, right? So I think that's huge. Uh, I mean, still for the, the younger guys coming up, I think there's still some visa issues. So you might be lucky to, you know, like see more guys getting capped quick so that you have a chance at a visa so that you can really develop. Um, I don't know. I think it, it should be good, but who knows what actually comes of it. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I, th I think there's a lot of potential to help out for sure, especially keeping, like you were alluding to, keeping those guys a little more centrally located as opposed to playing overseas or in the Southern Hemisphere and missing some of those tours and stuff. Yeah. Well, so, and hopefully, hopefully, you know, a little bit more collaboration with the teams where you can be like, hey, this is the style we look, or this is the role we're looking for for Cole Keith or something. Yeah. Can you maybe like put them in a similar role or something? Similar to what they do in New Zealand with their uh, their super rugby teams and kind of almost like a feeder system up, right? So that would be yeah, kind exactly. of, that's, that's a great idea. All right. So let's get back a little bit on you here. So this always impresses me like guys that I've chatted with have played in three or four world cups. You were in, you know, 2011, 2015, 2019. What impresses me a lot about you is that you're a prop. So the durability for you to play in three different world cups is astounding. And, and you didn't play in 2011 at New Zealand. You were actually 29 and it was five years after your first cap. What were your thoughts there? Like most you're a little bit older, but you were, and you weren't a rookie, but it was your first World Cup. What, were your, what was that experience for you? What was that? What were your expectations, I guess, going into that event in New Zealand? Uh, well, between my, my first cap, I think I got three caps between 2006 and 2008 or something because I was still playing football and, and things like that. So I didn't really devote the time. But kind of 2010, I, I was done football. Um, moved out to the coast, started playing for castaways and stuff and was having a trouble cracking the, the main team. So I was just really looking to have any impact at all, but then kind of started 2011, went to Wales, came back, just found myself as kind of the first choice loose head back when we only had, you know, three, three props on the bench most of the time type of a deal, right? Like it wasn't the full complement of front row. Right. So yeah, I don't know. It was, it was good. Uh, we, 
we had a bit of an older group, so there was lots of guys that were my age, and it was just kind of a, uh, I don't know, you got guys like DPH who's going to a second World Cup, and he's, I don't know, how many years, five years younger than I am or something, so yeah, it was the, interesting. But I, I remember watching that that event. Um, at, we were talking beforehand, Chauncey O'Toole, he's a, he's, he lives in my neighborhood, he kind of grew up in the same area, and I remember watching that game against New Zealand, watching you guys square off against the Hawk in New Zealand, like, I know it's nine years ago, but do you have any recollection of that? Was that intimidating or is it just get you fired up and ready to go? Usually it just gets you fired up and ready to go. But at that point, I mean, it was an amazing experience. I'll never say anything about it. Yeah. But I was kind of over the hawk by then because when you pull up, there's a hawk on the, like, after you're getting off the plane. Yeah. Then we have an official welcome, which is more heads. And, you know, we play Tonga and it's the Sepi Kao, which is essentially the Hawker, right? right. A different version of it. And then a high school comes and they want to do their Hakka. And then you go and you visit, you know, a village or something. And then they teach you a Hakka. And it's just like, it's been three weeks of straight Hakkas. And it was kind of like, okay, this is cool. But, you know, <laughs> I've seen enough. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> so, you know, fast forward four years later, it's 2015, you're, you're 33, and now you're in England, and it's the Rugby World Cup and the birthplace of rugby. What was that experience like? Like you had a little more, you know, a little more games under your belt and things like that. What, was there any change in your mentality? Uh, well, I think just for me, I, I had a more of a leadership role. I was you know, kind of, captaining some of the games when Ardron was there or like you know on the cusp of that but definitely in the leadership proper and so there's a little bit more responsibility uh you know from me towards him I guess um but no it was it was a good a good World Cup experience as well just the disappointing results um, but you know we're in almost every game I'd say except for maybe the France game but you know it was it was a great experience as well well, that's that's one thing about Canadian rugby is that, you know, you, you watch that South Africa game from 2019 and the score is not flattering. But when you look at what you guys did in the second half, and I think, you know, it was like maybe a seven or 10 point difference in the second half. And that, I think, was what I think the Canadian fans enjoy about players like you and the players that represent Canada is that you, you just don't quit. You don't give up. And in the 2019 World Cup, you were 38 you talked a little bit about your leadership place in, in 2015. What was that role like, you know, as a 38-year-old mentoring guys like a Cole Keith or, or what have you? How did you, how did you approach Japan differently from the previous two, or did you approach it differently? Uh, well, it was a little bit, obviously it was different. Like DJ was, had a way more, more of an impact in Japan than he did in, in England. Just like, I, I wasn't the automatic first choice anymore, which was, good to see because you know a 38 year old dude probably didn't be the first choice when it comes to to anything so dj definitely pushed a little bit more and, and he got way way more game time in in the new one but i had less of a official leadership role and it was more of a lead by example and you know do whatever role the team needs to be able, in my opinion and did, i i imagine um you know sp hearing how some some of your old teammates speak of you that's something that you probably would have embraced right? Like you would have cherished that or relish that chance to lead by example and push some of those younger guys. Yeah, I, that's the easiest way to do it for me, yes, because it, <laughs> I, well, I've been doing it a long time. I feel it comes pretty natural. I probably didn't at the start, but just, you know, <laughs> you do your work, you still have a good time, but you, you do your work first. And once it's done, then you can do kind of whatever you want. Right. That's fair. Yeah, um, I don't know. No, I think that's, I think that's absolutely reasonable. You want to, you want to lead by example. You want those other guys to understand how hard it is to, to, you know, work at that level. And if you can show them through your experience and you know, that's so much the better with that, you, you played over 50 matches for Canada. What advice would you give young players front row in particular, like the DJs and stuff about the type of player you need to be to have that type of longevity and that type of consistency, you know, day in, day out to represent your country. I, I think for me, it just was always fun. So, you know, as soon as it becomes a job, then it's time to hang them up. Or you're 38 or 12. As soon as it becomes work, like a work that you don't want to do every day, it's not fun anymore, then it's time to be looking for something else. And I'm sure that anything, right? Like if you're Yarmir Yager playing at 45 or what he is in the NHL, he probably still goes to work has fun every day because otherwise, why would you do it? Yeah. 
So that, yeah, that's great advice. Um, I coach rugby rugby and that's, you know, that's what it's about. It's fun and skill development. My high school, same thing. It's skill development, fun. It's all kind of ties hand in hand. So that's great advice for not just front row, but for anybody on the pitch. Okay. So Hubert, we're at our spot now where we talk, uh, we do a little quick fire. I've got about 20 questions here. They're not really meant to think. The first half are kind of about rugby and you. And the last half are more about you individually and your personality. All right. So are you ready to go? We'll see. All right. All right so let's start her off. Your best team you ever faced? Uh, the All Blacks. Although the score probably the spring ball were really unreal. <laughs> All right. Best player you ever faced? Uh, probably Keith Smith. Okay. He's All right. Playing for the French Barbarians, I guess. Yeah. Just a tough guy to go up against or really skilled? Yeah. <laughs> it was just one of the, well, he played for the All Black for a long time and, you know, it was just scrummage against him. If he wanted the ball, it was his ball. Didn't matter where or when. <laughs> All right. So that might be the answer for your next one. The next question is toughest player you ever faced. And what I tell guests is this is the person that if it's a 1v1, you don't want to look up and see them with the ball. Yeah. Again. I have to take it back to switching, but that's probably uh, Dato Cashley. Played for Claremont forever, but big prop. Okay. I don't know what it was, but he was, you know, always had my number. No just, matter one, what. just one of those guys. Best match you were ever a part of? My favorite would have been the 2011 game. It was just unreal to have a world victory. Oh, okay. That's, that seems reasonable. What's your favorite rugby tradition? Oh, man. <laughs> you can have more than one. That's that's a hard one. I don't think they still do it, but the last two in Wild Oats used to be when you scored your first first division try to do a naked lap in the field. I don't know if they'll do that or not, but uh, that was a pretty one. Make sure the cameras are off, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. The best team you ever played with? Uh, probably one of my favorite would have been the 2014 Manawa Tutos. That team that we played just it seemed like we could do no wrong that's awesome what's your rugby nickname uh it's kind of changed when i first started playing for canada and the prior and stuff it was cowhead <laughs> and uh since then we had mark Hanscom come up and he couldn't pronounce you so everybody called me herb from then because that's what he called me okay so herb all right but why cowhead prairie boy type thing or what well, I think it was having to catch up. Another team prop was behind me on the bus, and he couldn't see the movie. And he just said that I had a big fucking cow head. So, you know, that's stuck for a and bit. It's stuck, yeah. All right, what's the best rugby nickname you've heard? Yeah. I don't know. There's some good ones out there. Not sure. I'll have to pass on that one, I think. All right, fair. Maybe maybe Tyler Ardron's Retardron. That was pretty fun. <laughs> I don't know how apt it is, but, you know, it was a good nickname. All right, what's, uh, who's a player that you love to smash? That one guy you just love to, you know, get that little extra dig in on? Rarely, rarely catch him, but Gordy McRae's a good one. But, you know, he's pretty hard to, to nail down. He's pretty nimble. Yeah. All right, what's a rugby superstition? Uh, that I have or in general? Yours. Did you have one? Oh, uh, not really, no. Okay. I think the best one that I've heard of was Ed Monroe one day. He realized he put on his left sock, then his right sock, and his left shoe, and then his right shoe. And as soon as he realized that he did it, he's like, well, now I'm going to have to do it this way every single time. Great. <laughs> Three ex-teammates you would take golfing. Not much of a golfer. But I think if I was going to go golfing, I'd have to go front row. So Emil Christensen or, or Luke. He's just a crazy guy. Love to spend time with him. Uh, Jason Marshall, because, again, just another absolute beauty of a personality and would bring up the competitive nature. And then maybe Jab, but he could chirp Marshall the whole time. Yeah, be, he'd be funny out there. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to take a tee shot in any type of quiet setting, though, with, with Jeb there. Well, I'm not much of a golfer anyway, so it can't hurt me. <laughs> All right. Chips or cookies? Uh, definitely go savory with chips. All right. What kind of chips? Uh, salt and vinegar would probably be my go-to flavor. That's a good one. French fries or onion rings? Fries. French fries or poutine? Yeah. Well, poutine, obviously. <laughs> nice. You can only make fries better, right? That's right. Uh, what's your favorite beer? Uh, 
favorite beer. Right now, I've been drinking a lot of Paul 49. They got fun names like Trash Panda and Jerk Face 9000. So I've been drinking a lot of that. Good IPAs. <laughs> okay. What's a guilty pleasure? Uh, guilty pleasure. I don't know. It's probably that poutine. And <laughs> just every now and again, I had to Costco open and pick one up. Probably not the oh, best the Costco in the world, but, you know. Phil. <laughs> the Costco ones are massive, too. <laughs> All right. Best place. Yeah, and like three bucks or whatever they are, I guess. Yeah, that's right. Best place for a post match beer. Best place for a post match beer. I like the Castaway Wonders House in Victoria. All right. It's just What's... A, a great class, you know. Yeah. 100 year old house that full of rugby memories. Yeah, that would be nice to see. One of my old students is actually playing out there now. Just uh, just finished his first year over the course of this last year. So he's, he's really enjoying it out there. What, oh, yeah. ser- what series are you binge watching right now? I'm not much of a binge watcher. I'm kind of like, uh, I can watch one or two episodes. I don't really have anything on the go now, actually. Okay, that's fair enough. What's your favorite movie? Uh, favorite movie. That's a tough one. I like I like a lot of movies. Probably Dumb and Dumber. It's just a classic that you can't stop watching no matter what. Yeah, that's a, that's an absolute gem for sure. All right. Who would play you in the Netflix movie of your life? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess it depends if it was a drama or a comedy, I suppose, but it's I'm your, not really sure. It's your movie. It can be whoever you want. Yeah, I know. I know. Hopefully they get somebody, you know, younger and better than like Cole Keith or something. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if Cole can act. <laughs> All right. Who would play the leading lady? But he can't put, you know. Oh, fair enough. Who who play the leading lady? <laughs> who play the leading lady? Oh, man. Opposite of Cole, mind you. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, opposite of Cole, indeed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, these are tough questions. It's dumped me. I don't know. Maybe right. Sarah Pauly, a nice Canadian actor. Yeah, though. there you go. All right, last quick fire. What would the name of the movie be? Probably Cowhead, A Life. <laughs> that's, that's good. That'll work. I'll, I'll pay admission at the cinema to see that one for sure. All right, so we only Might get... Might be alone there. That'll be, I think it would be good. I think it would be, be a good comedy. A little Dumber and dumber style there, like uh, Cole Keith could be like the Jim Carrey, I guess, maybe. I don't know. Fair enough. All right, so that's it for the quick fire. We've got a few questions left. Who had the biggest impact on you as a player? Uh, Coaching-wise or just anybody? Just anybody. I mean, it could be a coach. You might have two or three people that spring to mind. Yeah, co- coaching-wise, probably uh, kind of a toss-up between Neil Barnes, who coached Canada for a long time, Fiji in the last World Cup, coaches the Chiefs. Just a, a great guy, but you know, willing to take a chance on it just because that works hard and, you know, isn't too flashy, but he doesn't try to change what you do. He just kind of takes your strengths and, and helps into them. And then uh, kind of my first coach in high school, would have been, uh, his name's Leon Borner, and just a great rugby guy and the, the type of guy that, you know, you're – I got cut open or something, and he's, you know, putting Vaseline in there, and you're like, well, I think I should come off. And he's like, no, nah, you know, if you come off, you got to be short, you know. <laughs> I don't know if you wanted that. And you're like, yeah, okay, I'm not going to off. But just trying to toughen that, me up a little that bit. That kind of guy where he's like, you can do it, but you're going to let everybody else down. <laughs> That's right. Just put a little bit yeah, of guilt exactly. on you there. Yeah. All right. What are your Which thoughts? You need sometimes, especially as a young guy. Yeah. Yeah. There's a difference between being hurt and being injured, is what my old high school coach used to say. Yeah. I don't know if I figured it out at this stage in my life, but. What are your thoughts on what makes a great team player? I, I think it's just somebody that can figure out what role he can fill, and then he does it whether he kind of likes you or not. You know, not everybody's going to be a DTH who's going to score high all the time. You need the grinders, and, and a lot of people don't like doing it, but if you're not willing to do it, then you're just never going to be that guy. You're never going to be the team guy. I think that's fair. Is a couple of your old teammates, uh, you know, stand out of, as those guys that – they knew their role and they grinded it out because they knew it was great, what was great for the team or what was best for the team without throwing, you know, you know. You, yeah. Yeah. I mean, probably the majority of guys you play with wind up being like that, right? Because like <laughs> the guys that don't do that don't last very long, but you know, 
former captain Pat Ryden comes to mind. Where, you know, he probably was a little bit of a reluctant captain, but did a great job, and and that was job, and you know, did what he needed to do to to help the team in everything. A guy like Jason Marshall again talked about him. Where went from playing number eight or quarterback for SFU to being a tight head prop, where he just like basically got fat. <laughs> And that was definitely not something that he wanted to do, but he, he did it anyways and you know, had a fairly successful doing it. Yeah. There's a couple of good really slimmed down since, you know. <laughs> You're saying that just in case he's listening or what? <laughs> no, he's definitely slimmed down since. I think last I heard he was doing rowing ergs or like world championships and stuff. So he's he's that guy. Wow. All right. What do you want to be remembered for as a rugby player? I don't know. I think I'd like to be remembered for it as that team guy, you know, who did what needed to be done, whether you like or not, type of a thing. And hopefully a good guy to have a beer with afterwards. That'd be good, too. <laughs> More than one, probably. <laughs> well, hopefully. <laughs> All right. So talk to us about your work-life transition from being a professional international rugby player to kind of becoming a spectator and you know, moving into your life after rugby. What what can you tell us about that transition? I'm still trying to, to do some coaching. I was coaching with Trinity West University in Langley uh, before this whole COVID thing. Hit. And then, yeah, after that, just trying to find a job to, to figure things out. So I mowed lawns on acreages all in Calgary here. And uh, Nick Blevins got me a job driving a Zamboni at the local arena. So nice. hopefully I uh, can do that for a bit. But yeah, just try to figure things out. It's been a pretty good time, I think. Just not having tons of rugby shoved down my throat that I'm like, oh, I wish I could be doing that. <laughs> so I think that's good. That's uh, that's not bad. You're just piecing things together day by day. And it's nice. it sounds like you've got a couple of old rugby guys there trying to help you out. Um, any great rugby stories you can share with us? Throw somebody under the bus if you want. Great or... rugby stories. No, I don't know. That's probably the part I miss the most is just that the like stupid pranks and stuff <laughs> like i don't know before the 2011 world cup one day we loaded all the boxes into gareth Reed's room maybe that was 2015 he's like yeah you throw these boxes away for me like yeah no problem so i just put them all in his room you know barricaded his door he's pretty pissed but you know, I imagine just you would... stupid harmless stuff like that <laughs> that's awesome um I, I actually meant to bring this up but the 2019 world cup in japan there you guys helped out after the typhoon cleanup and in 2011 i think it was the earthquake in new zealand and you guys did some work there as well um, i've always thought as a coach when i take my kids on tour we always do a service component whether it's visiting a children's hospital or, or taking like toys and donations to the you know to the local boys and girls club and stuff like that speaking to people that aren't in rugby when they hear of what you guys did as canadians as the canadian rugby team to help out in you know in new zealand and, and in japan um, it, they just ask, they ask questions like, that's amazing. How would they do that while they're actually playing? And does that take away from their thought process in the games and things like that? And I guess, can you speak to that? I know this one's kind of off, off hand because, you know, it wasn't one we prepped for, but can you talk to about those two events and how you guys kind of banded together to help out when so many other countries, I guess, didn't really have that opportunity or didn't take that opportunity, I guess, to support those two uh, those two areas when they were in need? Well, I, I don't really remember doing it in New Zealand. The earthquake was kind of the year before, I think, in 2010. Um, but um, for Japan, it was kind of the alternative of sitting on the hotel all day, being sad because we didn't get to play in Namibia. So it was, we missed our last game anyway. Instead of just kind of stewing in it, you might as well go do something. And, you know, not everybody to help out, but that's not everybody's jam. And when you're there, you just do the work. It was it was pretty funny. There's one point where uh, one of the guys that's reporting on it, you know, there's 12 of us or, you know, maybe a few more that are working. And one of the reporters asked Kingsley if he can use the shovel. He's like, I'm, I'm tired of taking pictures. I got to do something to help or whatever. So Kingsley gives him the shovel and he's a little bit of work or whatever. But it was just... <laughs> For that, it was just a no-brainer. There's the opportunity there, and it was better than sitting in the hotel doing because we didn't get to play our World Cup game. I don't know. No, I it think just that's like great. a natural thing to do, I guess. 
Yeah, I think it's a it's a Canadian thing to do. I think is to, to pitch in, roll up your sleeves, and help out when somebody's in need. So it was good on you guys to do that. That was, uh, I think, that made headlines for all the right reasons. Anyway, Hubert, thanks. It's been a it's been a it's been a treat to talk with you. And uh, you know, if uh, if you ever want to get back on again, maybe we can do like a front row discussion. Get you and DJ and Cole or something. It might be a little fun to have a few guys on and and talk about uh, life in that front row. The uh, you know, the, the hidden dark arts, I guess, of rugby or something yeah. like that. <laughs> anyway, thanks very much uh, and enjoy, uh, enjoy your rest of your summer, uh, rest of your summer. Right on. Thanks for having me. It's uh, a lot of fun. Thanks, Hubert. Thanks for taking the time and uh, joining us for a conversation about rugby today. Really appreciate you, uh, you taking the time out of your day to, uh, to have a chat with us. Uh, talking about getting them on again, we're talking about doing a uh, front row pod, trying to get uh, Hubert, uh, Ray Bark, Will Cole, Keith, and maybe uh, Justice Shears, uh, Sears Drew together uh, for a nice front row pod, and we'll see how that goes. That'll be fun if we can get it lined up. Uh, coming up next, we get a few on tap. We've got Sophie DeGuity, uh just 21 years old, out of Queens, but she was also in Rugby World uh, magazine, ranked as the best number eight in the women's game currently, which is a pretty big accolade, especially when she was only 20 when she got nominated and got elected. Uh, we've got Pat Parfrey. I uh, had a nice conversation with him the other day. Pat Parfrey, sorry, and uh, he's back in Newfoundland, uh, and Pat actually sings a little bit for us. Uh, he'll have to join us to see what tune he kind of sings. It was uh, it was pretty fun. I enjoyed that uh, that he was willing to do that. Uh, and we also have Matt Heaton. Uh, earlier today, I, I chatted with Matt about his uh, his rugby stories, and uh, he was also a pretty fun character. Uh, he had some good stories that you're going to want to hear as well. Aaron Carpenter, who uh, retired a couple of years back from Rugby Canada, is now coaching with the Toronto Arrows, Canada's most capped player. He and I will be uh, will be chatting here uh, sometime this week, uh, so we've got a few lined up. And then from there, we have Rod Snow. He, Rod and I are still try- going back and forth, trying to find a time and day, day to hook up. And then Tom Woods, uh, Tom of uh, Rugby Canada success, 80s and 90s, is uh, will be joining us as well. So... School starting back up uh, all over the country here in Canada. Uh, I go back to work on Monday. Yeah, I know people don't pity me because I'm a teacher. I <laughs> had, you know, a very extended summer break. Uh, we were working the entire time. We had online classes, took attendance and everything. Uh, very different, though. I'm really excited to get back in the class to see the students. Uh, they give me a lot of energy. And uh, it's just going to be a different different scenario with you know with working with students and, and seeing so many people uh, up close uh, it's going to be a lot of fun um, but it'll be it'll it'll cause some challenges as well but you know it's one of those things that we need to uh, I guess acclimatize to so that we can continue to uh, strive as humans anyway so as always massive thanks to our essential workers thanks to our support staff all the volunteers everybody that has been working during the pandemic uh, we need to always give thanks to Ben Sound Music, who supplies us with our intro and ending tunes. Um, as always, feel free to request topics uh, or even questions. You saw that list of uh, the list of guests that are coming up. Drop us a line if you want us to ask some specific questions, and we'll see if we can get them worked in. So, until the next pod, this is Jamie. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, stay sane, and most importantly, keep on rocking. Mm-hmm.